Okay, so this is the, this is the, the start of the, uh, the recording, so welcome everyone. Um, last week we finished kinematics, so this week we're going to start dynamics. Um, now before we get into dynamics, I kind of want to do, um, I don't know, something a little bit different. Uh, some teachers might already do this normally, but um, I don't know, I, I, because of this online format, communication might be a little bit more difficult, so I, I'm trying something new. We'll see how well it works. I want to look at some questions, um, very, very basic questions, to see if you can kind of make heads or tails of them ahead of time. And if you've taken a physics course in high school, you know, you might, you might have an, an idea of how to do some of these questions. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, it's been a while, I forget, but you know, I've seen it before maybe. Or maybe it's completely new to you and you've never seen it before and you feel daunted by some of these, even these easy questions. So um, I wanted to sort of look at uh, some of the, the easier questions ahead of time. And then after we're done talking about the material, I will, you know, you can look at the same questions again to see if you feel any any differently about approaching these questions. And presumably, hopefully, the, the, the hope is that students will look back on these questions and be like, oh yeah, these were, these were dead easy. How did I not know how to do this? And uh, that's hopefully reinforcement for you guys that you're actually learning something. It may not feel like you're always learning something. You know, you might still feel confused, but you're always learning something. And I think sometimes, um, you know, that, that kind of gets lost in translation. You know, you kind of get bogged down on the nitty gritty nitpicky details because you're hung up on this one thing you don't understand and students sometimes forget that they've learned all this other stuff and they're just focusing on the one thing they don't they don't understand so you know hopefully this allows you to sort of compare and contrast what you've gone into the lecture not knowing and what you come out of the lecture now knowing um, and hopefully that kind of keeps up your motivation to keep on trying hard um, I've, I've received a lot of emails actually uh, over the past week actually um, about assignment one and the intro assignment. Um, that's all, you know, very good emails, uh, very good questions. I would strongly recommend though that, uh, like I'm happy to answer questions, but I, I don't want to just spoon feed you the answer. That doesn't do anyone any good. Um, like the questions aren't there for me. Uh, the questions are there for you to learn. So if you're stuck on something, uh, I'm more than happy to help push you in the right direction, you know, give you some key terms to, to go Google, but ultimately the learning only occurs when the students actively go out and they, they have to find the answer for themselves. That's when the best quality of learning happens. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you've, at least on some level, you can, you can sympathize with that, with that claim. Um, if, if the instructor is always here spoon feeding you the answers, um, you know, you're gonna write them all down and you're gonna be happy because you have the answers for the, for the assignment questions or for the intro assignment. But, you know, come the test when you're not allowed to ask questions, you know, hey, how do you do this question? Um, you're going to be stuck. So I'm really trying to push you guys now while the stakes are low to, you know, really learn how to, to learn, figure out how you learn best, uh, how to learn to research things on your own. Um, not that I'm not here to help, don't get, don't get me wrong, or your TAs, but it's, it's really important we start, you know, we as a, as a teaching team, your TAs and myself are really pushing you guys to to sort of look up some of these things on your own because it's going to be a very 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 useful skill uh, in the workplace you know uh, I'm, i'll be the first person to admit that 90 percent of what you learn in school you're never going to need in the workplace uh, what you will need in the workplace is your ability to critically think and problem solve and work independently and uh, if presented with a problem that's challenging and, and is unfamiliar to you, your ability to actually help yourself. You know, if you keep going back to your, your boss saying, well, what does this word mean? What do you mean here? What do you mean here? You know, you're gonna get fired so fast. You know, that's not gonna do you any good. So, you know, I would like, I would like people leaving this course to not only know a little bit of physics, but, you know, to be uh, better trained for the workforce compared to, let's say, other students, right? Um, you know, I'm trying to give you guys a leg up as best as I can. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, let's, uh, let's read. We won't necessarily do these questions because we don't have the tools yet to do these questions, but let's read them to see how, how confused we feel or our initial instincts. So an elevator, which has a certain mass, it's almost 5,000 kilograms, uh, is to be designed so that the maximum acceleration that that uh, elevator experiences is about 7% that of free fall. So pretty small. What are the maximum and minimum forces that the motor should exert on the supporting cables? 
uh, meaning obviously you can get the uh, you can get the, the elevator moving really really fast obviously just get a really powerful motor on there and just get it get it cranked right up but people in the elevator that's unsafe for them or the passengers in the elevator you know if you if they're going down you know from floor 20 to floor one if you let them free fall that's very dangerous so you don't want the acceleration to be g you want the acceleration to be safe like much less than g so um you know the motor has to be designed to deliver the, the appropriate kind of force. So, you know, do you feel properly equipped at the moment to tackle that kind of analysis? Uh, another example would be if you double the mass and have the radius of the planet, by what factor would the gravity on the Earth's surface change? Um, and this is perhaps not relevant to day to day people. I mean, how often do we get to explore other planets? But you know, it's, it's a lot of the times common in, in fictional movies, you know, when you're on the moon or you're on Saturn or Mars, or let's say you're in Star Wars and Star Trek where you're just jumping galaxies all together. You know, different planets will have different masses and different sizes, and that definitely affects the gravity. Um, reading this question, do you, do you think you have the right tools at the moment to, to tackle solving that kind of problem? And another, uh, a third example would be something like, you know, Tarzan, plans to cross a gorge by swinging in an arc, uh, which is, you know, he's hanging from a vine. If his arms are capable of exerting a force of, uh, you know, 1100 Newtons, what is the maximum speed that he can tolerate while, his, while he's swinging? Assuming Tarzan have a mass of 78 kilograms, you know, in a certain length of, of uh, vine. And of course, I mean, every human is going to have an inherent limit of what their arms can, can afford when they're swinging uh, or in general, um, there's, you know, other, otherwise your arms will get ripped right off or if they're not ripped right off, significant damage will be done. So there's an inherent upper limit to what kind of force your arms can withstand. So, you know, or do you feel comfortable, I guess, tackling the kind of problem to figure out, you know, the maximum speed that he can achieve uh, during his travel. So these are just very simple examples, I suppose, of, of what you can do when you study forces. And uh, I, don't, I don't expect that many of you will feel comfortable at the moment trying to approach these problems because we haven't talked about them. And uh, based on some of the questions I've been getting over the past week, it's clear that um, you know, students are, are focusing more on what they don't know and, and they're not really remembering how much they've learned. So I'm trying to hopefully curb those frustrations and you know, try to switch your brain to thinking, look, yes, at the moment we don't know anything, but maybe by the end of this lecture or the end of tomorrow's lecture, um, there will be stuff you can look back at these and be like, hey, look, you know, maybe I don't know how to do this perfectly, but I, I, I'm confident at least in how to start and, and how to approach the question. So um, that's my intent there. Now scrolling down, I don't know why this isn't scrolling. Oh, there we go. So the agenda of the topics that we're trying to look for or we're trying to cover either today and or today and tomorrow, depending how fast we are, is uh, what is a force and how do we think of a force? Uh, I guess a little bit about why we even study forces at all. I mean, it, it's not like physicists go out inventing branches of, of analyses that are meaningless if, you know, for no reason. There's clearly a reason why the topic of forces needed to be developed. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Then we're going to move into Newton's three laws of motion, the inertia, Newton's second law, and Newton's third law. Um, I don't know why the first law is the only one with the title. It just it is what it is. Um, and then after we kind of talk about the, those, you know, mathematical backgrounds and the constructs, then we're going to move into actually presenting, presenting you a technique of how to actually set up these problems and solve them, because at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. Okay, so moving on. So now we're gonna start with the actual topic of dynamics. So um, as I said earlier, we started with our analysis with, and I'm gonna use this loosely, we, we noticed that motion existed. And I mean, it sounds kind of funny, uh, you know, that we just happen to notice motion exists, but you know, clearly that's not how it happened in real life. You know, these way back in the day, these, these scientists, I think, well, way, way, way back then, they, they weren't even called scientists, they were called philosophers. Um, they would ponder and think about the implications of certain things. So, you know, we knew motion existed and uh, we were thinking, you know, is there a way to predict where it 
where the object would go. Um, now, we're, now we're, tr we're left with wondering where, where did this motion come from? You know, previously we assumed the motion already existed and we wanted to know where it went, but we still haven't answered the question, what caused the motion? You know, we've, we've pretty much got it under wraps. Assuming the motion exists, we're good. We know where it's going to go. We've done that last week. But as a scientist, now we have, we're left thinking there's a, there's a piece of the puzzle that's missing. What, what could possibly cause motion? What can't cause motion? So that's what this is. That's what dynamics is. It's a study of what causes motion. Now, there's a bit of a backstory here, which is kind of funny. Um, way, 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 way back in the day, we're talking ancient Greek, um, you know, 600 BC. Like it's like almost 2000 years ago, uh, on the order of magnitude, I guess, of 2000 years ago is what we're talking about. And way back in the day, um, the Greeks, the Greek philosophers hypothesized um, their own theory of what caused motion. And as, as is with every other science, uh, physics is an experimental science. So we can form hypotheses based on the observations that we can gather from the world around us. So what the Greeks noticed way, way, way back at 600 BC was, you know, if you took an object, let's say, I'm going to use an object, a boulder. I don't even know if that's accurate for 600 BC, but let's, let's say a boulder. If they pushed a boulder, with a constant force and you can easily verify that it's a constant force because a human would, it, would be having to push this boulder. So, you know, your muscles are, are constantly trying to apply a force to this boulder. So it's very much a verifiable constant force. And, uh, and they noticed that the boulder would only move a constant velocity. So that was their hypothesis. They said, what, what caused motion? They said a constant force would result in a constant velocity. And it was easy for the rest of the scientific community at the time to get on board with this because it was observable. They say, see, my theory at least has some merit to it. If I stop pushing the boulder, the boulder stops moving. And if I push the boulder, it moves. So everyone else was like, yeah, sure, that makes total sense. And it is amazing the, the length of time at how wrong uh, these scientists were. In fact, it was only really around 1600, and we're, we're right now in, in the year 2020, obviously. So the year 1600 was really only 400 years ago, really, 420 years ago, but you know, I don't, I don't actually know exactly when it was in the 1600s. So it was about 400 years ago um, when a, another physicist by the name of Galileo came along and sort of realized that these Greeks that have been prolific for almost 2,000 years have just been deadly wrong. Um, and that just goes to show you the power of, of old school science really is, you know, whoever can pontificate the loudest uh, was deemed to be correct. So that's bad, I guess, in, in terms of science, because that's really not how, how the world works. Um, Galileo at the time, he came up with uh, an interesting thought experiment. Let me zoom into my page here. There we go. So he, he came up with an interesting thought experiment in and around the 1600s. Galileo noticed, or, or hypothesized, I should say, this is called the thought experiment. If I take a ball and I, I hold the ball at rest at the top of a hill and I let it go, as the ball rolls down the hill, he observed that the ball was speeding up as the ball was going down the hill. So he said, interesting, there's something that's causing motion here and not just steady motion, like a constant velocity, but the velocity is constantly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then he noticed on the other side, when the ball was traveling up the ramp, the ball was slowing down. And uh, he noticed it actually stopped at the same altitude as what it was when he first dropped the ball. So he said, okay, this is interesting. When the ball is going down the hill, it's speeding up. And when the ball is going up the hill, it's slowing down. So he actually predicted that the ball in the middle here on the flat land, the ball should actually 
not be speeding up or slowing down. It would just be traveling at a constant speed. Now, further that, he said, this is a symmetric ramp, meaning the, alt uh, the angle on the left side equals the angle on the right side. Now, what if he modified the ramp so he kept the same steep angle on one side, but he made the angle on the other side more shallow? Well, he tried this out and he noticed that the ball still sped up, obviously, uh, on the left-hand side as it was going down the ramp, and the ball still slowed down as it went up the right-hand side. However, it traveled farther, um, farther in terms of distance, farther in terms of distance. However, it stopped when it reached the same altitude as before. And then he extended this further and said, well, if the angle of the second slope was decreased enough to the, fe uh, to the point where it was a horizontal slope, meaning it was not really a slope at all, the ball would accelerate as it goes down the ramp and then during the middle, we've already concluded uh, from the previous thought experiment that it wouldn't change velocity at all throughout the, the flat part. And if it, never, if it never went back up the ramp, then it would just keep on going forever. And this was in direct conflict with the previously established law. Um, Galileo pretty much asserted to the scientific community that, you know, when the ball was traveling down the hill, everyone, even the Greeks, could get on board with the fact that it was speeding up, no problem. But what was challenging was uh, Galileo was saying that after the ball already had some motion at the bottom of the ramp here, uh, the ball would actually continue moving forward indefinitely. And no one would be pushing it. And I mean, this, this was in direct violation with what had been previously established for 2,000 years. Now, if you think about it, that's pretty bold. Um, you know, most of what we're experiencing in our lives is not 2,000 years old. I mean, we have a huge culture of technology right now. I mean, I'm delivering an online lecture with a, a tablet and a webcam, which would be, you know, would have been next to impossible even 10, 15 years ago. So most of the things we're used to, uh, we've actually lived through. We've seen them develop. You know, we've lived through the smartphone being introduced. So, you know, we're very open-minded is what I'm trying to say. You know, we're very willing to accept new ideas and change previous theories to fit new ideas. Back in the day, they weren't, uh, especially in the 1600s. They, they definitely weren't. And back then, the Catholic Church actually had a lot of, lot of power. And um, Galileo, being Italian, go Italians. Um, he, he was actually living in Italy and the Pope and Galileo actually had a huge feud with one another um, because Galileo was actually going against the church in terms of, you know, their scientific theories. So it actually caused a lot of turmoil and Galileo's assertions and, and ideas were actually rejected and Galileo died being told by the church and the world he was a, he was a nut pretty much. And it wasn't until much later, about 200 years later, and in about the 1800s, uh, late 1700s, uh, when Sir Isaac Newton came along and revisited the ideas of Galileo and said, hey, you know, Galileo was on to something. And uh, when a completely different, now Galile uh, Sir Isaac Newton was English, not, not Italian. So the Catholic Church had less influence over, over in Britain. So when Sir Isaac Newton came along and sort of revisited his ideas and sort of said, hey, look, yeah, um, this, guy, this guy was onto something, you know, for one, it was 200 years later, so they were kind of more willing to accept it. It was the second time someone kind of stumbled upon this idea, so they're like, okay, maybe there is merit to it. And the Catholic Church didn't have nearly as much influence in, in Britain as it does in Italy. So they weren't able to kind of squash that idea as much. And then, then Newton was really, really the driving force that sort of evolved this, this uh, branch of analysis. But, you know, we should give credit to Galileo. He was the one who, who kind of pioneered this idea and unfortunately, you know, died being told he was, he was a nut job. So that's, that's rather unfortunate, but uh, it is a fun anecdote nonetheless. Now, um, trust me when I say, uh, I am the last person uh, who would have thought 
to, to give a history lecture in a physics class. Um, I am definitely not a history person. I've never liked history in high school. But um, I don't know, I think it's a fun little anecdote, a little background of information of what led to the, the study of forces and, and a reminder that it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to make mistakes. Um, even in chemistry, in grade 11 chemistry, you taught the octet rule. And then in grade 12 chemistry, you're taught that that's all wrong. You know, you're taught about orbitals and Vesper. And then, you know, uh, you hit first year university and, you know, Judith Poe or Krish will tell you, nope, half of what you learned in grade 12 is all wrong. And then you hit second year uh, organic chemistry and you're like, yeah, everything you learned in first year chem is also all wrong. So, I mean, um, you know, we go through the motions and we, we sort of teach you kind of how scientists have, have messed up historically and how these sort of mistakes have led to, to growth and knowledge. So, you know, it's okay for students to make mistakes as well. That's why we're all here. So anyway, now that we're sort of past all the history, uh, let's take a look at what a force actually is. Um, what what uh, Galileo and Newton sort of stumbled upon was a force. A force is the thing that's responsible for causing, um, for causing motion. And uh, Galileo was actually responsible for hypothesizing the existence of friction. Uh, he was saying in real life, the reason why the boulder slows down when you stop or when you stop pushing it is because um, it's being subject to some sort of resistance, which we now call friction. And uh, the reason why the Greeks got it wrong for so long is because there is no such thing as a frictionless surface. And, um, you know, it, it took a genius to sort of invent the idea of, of friction and to formalize it. And then we were able to distinguish between what we observed in real life and the actual physical laws of, of nature. So anyway, let's, let's take a look at a short video now about uh, what is a force and hopefully I don't know, hopefully give you some some insight uh, I'm just gonna have to share share a YouTube video so let's hope it's not blurry like it was last time what is a force it seems to be an idea that a lot of people are confused about. It's like Star Wars is the only source of knowledge. Okay. What is a force? Um, it's like Jedi. The for like force is how you raise X-wings out of swamps. You, you just concentrate. What would you say a force is? Well, other than Jedi's. <laughs> <laughs> but out, outside of Star Wars, a force is energy and mass. So, if you have a huge thing moving really fast, you got a lot of force. It's like getting hit by a truck, as opposed to getting hit by this tennis ball. Um, force is energy um, that comes from somewhere. Something that exerts energy on all other matter. The movement. The movement of something in one direction and the Atmosphere. Trevor, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, this indescribable thing that kind of keeps us from flying off into space. Nobody really knows what it's um, about. It's just a theoretical kind of thing. And that should teach me to interview philosophy students. But contrary to what she said, there were some people who knew what force was about. <laughs> something that makes something move from its original position. How you propel something or how you get something to move or how to shape, reshape something. It's a kind of uh, attraction or direction or something like that, that like uh, an object has on it. Yeah. Push. Yeah, push. Or uh, a pull. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, it took some coaching, but force is essentially just a push or a pull. So then I asked people, what forces are acting on you right now? Most could identify a downward gravitational force towards the center of the Earth, but uh, then things got a little bit hazy. Can you tell me about the forces on you at the moment? Um, well, probably there's a big force uh, downwards towards the center of the Earth. Which is? Uh, that's, that's gravity, what we call gravity, I guess. Well, the gravity of Earth? Where is it? Where, where, how does it act on you? Well, it keeps me on the Earth. I, it's just I don't, I don't fly away. 
I would be standing on the earth and it's pulling me down and making sure that I'm stuck to the earth, yeah. Okay, what other forces are on you? Are there any other forces on you? Uh, there are. There's air pressure forces around me. Uh, there's my own muscular forces keeping me up, my skeletal forces, those kind of things. Uh, and also then uh, different uh, sort of weather or climatic conditions. In terms of what, like wind, weather, that sort of thing, or just normal gravity? This is what's keeping me on the ground. It's like gravity. <laughs> so there's a gravitational force pulling you down? Yeah. Um, any other forces that are acting on you? Big Friction. Time? Like on me right now? On you right now. I can't think of anything else except gravity. Only one force. It is, I mean, surely there's like well, a lot I, of small ones, but... He, l l let me put this to you. If there's only one force on an object, what does it do? Uh, it goes towards it. But there is another force acting on you, which is a pretty important one. Because there's like, there's a force acting down, right? There's a gravitational force. Mm -hmm. What about a force acting up? No, no, no up forces? Uh, not that I can think of. Okay, so what forces are acting on you right now? Okay, so um, we're back. Hi. Um, so I, I always show that video every single time I, uh, I teach this class because I think it's, it's nice to sort of uh, show everybody that it's, you know, the average, the average person actually knows something about physics. Um, now, if you've never taken a physics class or you're not a physics major, then, you know, could you, could you hold your own in a detailed conversation? Probably not. But, you know, the point is, you know, there are, there are, you know, a lot of people that just have a, a sort of basic understanding of physics as, as the host of that clip pointed out, you know, everyone, almost everybody got gravity. And, uh, you know, this is sort of the downfall of, of an oral, of an oral test is, you know, you just sort of look, look at the, at the students or, you know, look at the, your people you're interviewing uh, waiting for an answer and then they just start panicking and spewing whatever knowledge they think they have and you know when he said are there any other forces you know they started saying things like oh atmospheric forces muscular forces you know all things that are they're not technically wrong i mean yes there is a force from the atmosphere there are internal muscular forces um but then he tried helping them he tried saying things like well you know if there was only one force on an object um you know downward like gravity for instance if there's only one force you know picture Picture you have an object and you, you were to push it down. You know, there's a force downwards. Well, if there's only one force on this object and it's pushing down, the object would move downward, right? That's what he was trying to say. He was trying to lead them to that conclusion. They just weren't picking it up, picking up, uh, picking up on what he was putting down. He was trying to say that, yes, there is gravity pushing down on you. However, you're not moving down. You know, gravity is acting on all of us uh, and it pulls us toward the Earth's surface. But once we reach the Earth's surface, we stop moving. You know, so if we jump up, gravity pulls us down and we, we fall down until we reach the surface and then we stop moving. Gravity, gravity doesn't magically stop acting on us once we've touched the surface. So he was trying to allude to the fact that there, there must be a second force acting on the object. Um, now, in, even in this class, we haven't talked about what that force would be or what the name that physicists use to call that force, but we should at least be able to logic our way to the existence of that force um, just by the sheer notion of the fact that we understand that a force is simply a push or a pull. You can push hard, you can push weak, so there's, a, there's an inherent magnitude of the force. Um, but there's also a direction. You can either push it away or push it toward or pull it towards. So there's a magnitude and a direction, and you can think of it as a push or a pull. And you should be able to logically conclude that if there's only one push on an object, then it should move forward or in the direction of that force. And the fact that we aren't just continually falling into the Earth's center, um, we should be able to conclude there, that there must be a, at least a second force preventing us from falling to the Earth's center. But we'll, we'll get to what that force is later. But uh, there's more of a conceptual video. Okay, so let's, uh, let's keep going. I don't know why this doesn't want to scroll. Oh, come on.
Scroll, please. I do not know why this is not scrolling. Oh, okay. This is what I get for buying Windows machine. If you like Windows, I apologize. Okay, um, so before we go much further, let's do a polling question. Um, I'm hoping, okay, there we go. I'm gonna launch the poll again. Uh, actually, before I do, I'm gonna make this smaller and then hopefully that allows you to sort of see the question as well as the poll. I'll, I'll, I'll also read it out to you as well. Okay, so the poll should be live. Consider a cart on a horizontal frictionless table. Of course, there's no such thing as a frictionless table, but let's assume there is. Once the cart has been given an initial push and then released from our hands, the cart will slowly come to stop, continue along with a constant acceleration, continue with a decreasing acceleration, continue with a constant velocity, or stop immediately after we let go. So there seems to be about 120-ish of us who are attending at the moment. There's about 80 of us who have responded. About 90 of us have responded now. About 100. About 105, we're sort of tapering off now. Okay, so for the sake of time, I think I'm gonna end the poll. Um, it's, if you haven't voted yet, that's okay. Um, these are not for marks, it's just for, you know, diagnostic. So let me share the results with you. So we have a very definite winner. 72% uh, of you voted D, which is good, because that happens to be the correct answer. But for, if you didn't vote D, let's, let's maybe talk about why very briefly. So um, Galileo was the one who hypothesized uh, that if a, if, if a ball were to be rolled down a hill, it would be speeding up. And this is analogous to us pushing the cart with our hands. You know, we're giving it motion. We're giving it a force which will cause motion. The ball is rolling down a hill, which is a force which will cause motion. But Galileo said once the ball reached the middle ground, uh, even though there's no force acting on it, it would continue on at a constant velocity. And that's analogous to us letting go of the cart. We are no longer pushing it. We're no longer in contact with the cart. There's nothing pushing the cart forward. There are no horizontal forces on the cart. So Galileo reasoned without resistance, his, his word was resistance. We use the word friction. Without friction or without resistance, the boulder or the cart in this case would continue moving on at a constant velocity because there's nothing slowing it down. Um, this is actually indicative of Newton's first law. Uh, inertia, a body in motion wants to stay in motion and a, and a body at rest wants to remain at rest. That's, well, that's what we call Newton's first law. Um, it's also in the theme song of Bill Nye, the science guy. Um, I don't know if you're old enough to have seen those, those video clips, but um, you, should, you should definitely YouTube them. They're, they're something fun to watch. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing the results. So the answer is in fact, uh, D, or I guess no, number four, um, it will continue on with a constant velocity. So as I said, this brings us to the first law of, of um, first of three Newton's, Newton's laws was inertia. So this is just a funny little clip, I guess, of a uh, little funny little comic of, of inertia. Um, it's a Newton's cradle as a wrecking ball, which I think is, is kind of funny. Um, it's also very in line with a physicist's way of thinking. I mean, yeah, we could do things the easy way, but you know, it's more fun to do things the fun way, as long as it's not more mathematically rigorous, because that's just the boring kind of complicated. But um, this is, I would actually like to make this a wrecking ball with, with Newton's cradle. That, that, would be, that would be really fun. Actually, come to think of it, I think Mythbusters did this. I think Mythbusters actually made a Newton cradle with like really big wrecking balls. I think there was an episode where they did that. I might look that up and show you guys tomorrow. Um, there really isn't much to say about inertia. Um, I should probably write something about it though. So I will say that inertia, 
um, Newton's first law. Often when we talk about Newton's laws, for some reason, we denote them with the letter N and then the Roman numeral convention. I don't know why, but Newton's first law is called inertia. And it says, well, practically, um, when no, when no external unbalanced force acts on an object, its velocity, oops, that's not how you spell velocity, velocity remains constant. Um, that's a more technical definition. Um, as I said before, a more colloquial, a more casual definition would be, you know, a body in motion wants to remain in motion and a body at rest would like to remain at rest. But this is a more technical definition. Okay, um, moving on, because there really isn't much in the way of mathematics uh, for, for Newton's first law. Moving on to Newton's second law. Uh, if you can't tell, I, I think that elephant is on rollerblades, a uh, little cheeky clip. So Newton's second law, so capital N with a Roman numeral two, uh, Newton's second law quite simply is that the net force acting on an object is equal to mass times its acceleration. And you have to be careful here because acceleration is a vector and mass is in fact a scalar. So here you say acceleration is a vector, which means um, if the right hand side is a vector, then the left hand side also has to be a vector, right? That's what equation means. Equation means whatever's on, on the left is on the right. So. If the right hand side is a vector, the right hand, uh, the left hand side has to be a vector as well. Now, A happens to be the only vector on the right hand side. It's not like you're adding multiple vectors on the right hand side. There's only one vector on the right hand side. Um, mass is a scalar. So when you multiply a vector by a scalar, all you're doing is you're taking some sort of existing vector, let's call it the acceleration vector, and if you multiply it by a scalar m, all you're doing is you're taking that vector and you're making it longer or shorter if mass is really small. But you're, you're just scaling that vector. You're keeping the same direction. You're just making it larger or smaller depending on the, the scalar multiple m. So this means that the net force is actually parallel to your acceleration. And uh, this is actually a direct consequence of forces cause motion. When you push an object, uh, when you, oops, that's not how you spell push. When you push an object, uh, it will, it will move, A, there'll be an acceleration, it will move in the direction it was pushed. So Newton's second law is the, the very mathematical equation that actually governs and explains why when you push an object in a certain direction, it moves in the exact same direction that you push it. Um, now, another way, I'm just breaking down this equation a little bit more for you, because um, it's a pretty simple equation. There's only three things in there. There's F, M, and A, right? It's fairly simple. Um, but just to make sure we're all uh, on the same page with the math here, is I will also add that the force is proportional to the acceleration. Now, I don't know if you've seen this sign before in math class. This is the sign for propor proportional. And uh, it's really important in physics to understand proportionalities. So in this context, F being proportional to A means if I push twice as hard, the object will have an acceleration that's twice as large. That's what proportional means. If an object's acceleration is reduced by a factor of two, 
it means you require half as much force to decelerate that object or to accelerate that object, depending what you're doing. So that's what that means. Um, another thing to consider is that acceler, oh, wrong color, sorry. Another thing to consider is that the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So let's say you had a motor or some, some mechanism to cause a force. Um, you know, let's say my arms. Well, I'm only so strong. You know, there, there's an inherent maximum force that my weak arms that have never been to the gym or have never lifted any weights um, could exert. So if we assume force is constant, then we would say something like constant equals m times a. Well, that means that acceleration and mass are inversely proportional. If we want to, if, if we only have a, a limited amount of resources to push this object, then if we want to maximize acceleration, we have to decrease its mass. That's what this says. As acceleration goes up, mass has to go down. And um, the other thing, the last thing I want to point out, just again, because it's a, it's a subtle math detail and every single year students, there's, a, there's always a few students that um, kind of overlook this subtlety, that the net force is actually the sum of many individual forces. That's what net force means. Now, this notation might be a little bit new to you. If you've taken first year calculus, you should be fine with this notation. It's called sigma notation. But um, I'll write out kind of what this means. But the net force effectively just means F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However many forces are acting on the object. If you have six forces acting on the object, then you have to vectorally add those six forces to obtain the net force. If you have two forces acting on the object, then you have to vectorally add two forces to obtain the net force on the object. Um, a way to graphically represent this would be things like, you know, if you have F1, F2, F3 added together, then the resultant force would be from tip to tail of the start and the finish, and this would be something like F net. So please understand when, when you say like F equals MA, it's not just one force, it's actually the sum of all the forces. And uh, I'll say I'll, there's, there's a, an added an added detail here, I'll say bonus, bonus, F net itself, oops, that's not how you spell self, F net itself is not, is not a force. It is a resultant of many individual forces acting together, but the net force, F net itself, is not a force. Gravity is a force. Friction is a force. F net is a result of many forces acting together. So please, uh, moving forward in this class, and I will try to remind you as we do examples, but F net is not a force. So let's move on to some practice. Um, this is a relatively easy example, so we should be able to breeze right through this. What is the net force required to give a car uh, which has a mass of 1,600 kilograms, an acceleration of 4.5 meters per second squared. So we're saying what force is required, so uh, F equals question mark, with a mass of 1,600 kilograms and an acceleration of 4.5 meters per second squared. So we just use Newton's second law and we say, the force required is m times a, um, so the magnitude of the force required would be simply 1600 times 4.5. Now, if you had a calculator, um, I think you'd be able to calculate this to be about 7.2 times 10 to the 3 newtons. Now, let's say you didn't have a calculator. I'm always trying to get you to practice other themes within the class as we do, you know, current examples. 
let's, let's say we didn't have a calculator. How would we approximate this? Well, you could approximate this by saying, you know, 1600 becomes 2000 and uh, 4.5 becomes, oops, we rounded 1600 up. So let's round 4.5 down. So 2000 times four would be approximately 8,000. And the real answer, as we know, is 7,200. So it's not bad. It's not, it's not totally off. It's not like we calculate, it's not like we approximated our value to be like 100 newtons when the real answer was 7,200 newtons. You know, it's close. That's the whole point of approximating. Um, B, what is the acceleration of the wagon uh, given force and mass? Um, B is fairly easy. Uh, I don't know if I really want to spend time doing B, but again, you do the same equation, F net equals MA. Um, we're given F, we're given a, uh, M, so you just divide to get A. And then the same thing is true with C. Um, C is, um, again, F equals MA. You're given A, you're given F. You can divide to find M. So those are fairly standard examples. Um, here's one that is a little bit more involved. So let's, let's do this one. This one is worth doing. Two people are pushing a stalled car uh, as shown in the figure. The mass of the car is known to be 8,000, oh, sorry, 1,850. Words and physicists, usually a very bad combination. So I saw a number, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the number down. Mass of car equals 1,850 kilograms. One person applies a known force of Okay, so one person, so force of one person, F1 equals 275 Newtons. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, and this was completely my bad. Um, Newton, a force is a new quantity that we need to measure. Uh, we've talked about the SI units for time, which is seconds. We've talked about the SI units for mass, which was kilograms or grams, depending on the scale. And we've talked about the SI unit for, um, length, which was meters. Uh, we've introduced a new quantity now, in this case, uh, a force. So we, there's, there needs to be a way to measure uh, quantitatively with a number to measure a force. And uh, the unit of that number, the SI unit for that number is called a Newton in honor of Sir Isaac Newton, the physicist who formalized all of this. Actually, Newton, for the record, invented calculus in about, you know, three months. So, you know, there are people who spend their entire university degrees um, spending, studying calculus from first year and then second year they do multivariable calculus and third year they do, you know, partial differential equations and then fourth year they do other complicated things. Um, Newton invented all of that in about three months um, on a dare no less as well, which was kind of funny. So um, yeah, he definitely deserves to, to have a unit named after him. So the SI unit for force is Newton. And um, you can actually figure out kind of what goes into a Newton. Um, we know, let me just maybe draw this in a different color for you. We know that F net equals MA. So uh, we know the dimensions on the left-hand side are a Newton. And the dimensions on the right-hand side, well, mass is measured in kilograms and acceleration is meters per second squared. So you actually know that a Newton can be represented as a kilogram meter per second squared. So uh, Newton is not what I would call a base unit. Uh, Newtons can be broken down into other more fundamental units like kilograms, meters, and seconds. But um, the, the quantity of a Newton is an SI unit, meaning it's the standard worldwide. When we talk about a force in Germany, when we talk about a force in Asia, when we talk about a force in South America, talk about a force in North America, the unit that the scientists use worldwide, the standard, is a Newton. So that's, that's the whole point of having a, a, an SI unit. It's something that worldwide we all agree upon. Okay, I'm continuing to read. There's one person that uh, pushes a car, 275 Newtons, while the other person, so the other person, oh, I'm still writing in red. Let's change that back to black. While the other person pushes at 560 Newtons, um, but in the, uh, oh, no, hold on, not 560, sorry, uh, 395 Newtons. Okay, both forces act in the same direction. 
a third force, oh, there's a third force, a third force of 560 newtons acts, uh, also acts on the car, but in the opposite direction. So this is more of a resistive force. This is kind of what Galileo was talking about. There's a, a frictional force or a resistive force. Um, this force arises because of the friction and the extent to which the pavement opposes the motion of the tires. Find the, the net acceleration of the car. So we know that there is a force of minus 560 newtons. In fact, actually, I'm going to, I'm a little bit sloppy with my notation. Let me, let me draw vector signs like this. And um, then when I say F net, equals ma, I need to assign a direction. You'll notice here that I have um, vector notation in my equation. And the way to handle vector notation is when I want to drop the vector notation, I need to assign a coordinate system. I need to tell the reader and my math what's positive and what's negative. So we think to ourselves, we only have 1D motion. Right, we either have pushing forward or resisting, which would be backwards. So let's let's assume forward equals positive, and thus backwards would be negative. So when I say F net, as I mentioned before, uh, it's the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object. So all the forces acting on the object would be vector F1 plus vector F2 plus vector F3. And the sum of those would equal M times vector acceleration. Now, this is still technically a vector equation. So when I drop the vector signs, I have to make sure I get my plus and minus signs correct. So I'm gonna drop the vector sign now and I say, okay, F1, F1, I'm gonna reread the question. F1 is in which direction? So one person applies a force of 275 newtons, a second person, 375 newtons, and they act in the same direction, presumably forward as they're pushing the car. So when I drop the vector signs, I'm gonna leave F1 positive. In fact, if you want, you can even put a little positive sign out front to remind you that you've accounted for it. And then positive F2, because F1 and F2 are pushing the car forward. However, F3 is 560 newtons, and it, uh, the question says it pushes in the opposite direction of the car. So when I drop the vector notation, I have to add a negative here, F3. And A, we don't know which way the acceleration is gonna be. So I'm gonna drop the vector sign and I'm just gonna see mathematically if A calculates to be a positive number or A calculates to be a negative number. And based on the sign of my value, of my final value here, I'll know what way the car is accelerating. Now, thinking about this logically, obviously the acceleration has to be positive because you have things pushing forward. And there's no way the friction pushing backwards is greater than the force pushing forwards because friction is a result of forward motion. So you can sort of logic your way, like a sanity check, if you will, um, that the answer is gonna have to be positive for acceleration, but let's just make sure we, we got these numbers correct. So um, F1 is going to be 275, uh, F2 is going to be 395, and F3 is 560 equals MA. And then if we add all those together and divide by M, we say that the acceleration is going to be, let's see here, this is going to be 400, 5, 6, 670 minus 560. Ooh, I don't know why. That's weird. Um, all over M. How much was M? M was, there we go, 1,850. 1,850. And um, 670 minus 560 is 110 over 1,850. Now, um, I don't have a calculator on me, but if you did, you could easily calculate the number. Um, if you wanted to approximate the number, that would be easy enough to approximate. 110, that's close enough to 100. Uh, 1,850, well, we, we rounded 110 down to 100, 
So let's also round 1,800 down uh, and 50 down to 1,800. And the, so this is going to be approximately 1 over 18. And 1 over 18 is kind of around 1 over 20. I mean, it's, it's obviously not perfect, but you know, that's the whole point of approximating. And 1 over 20 is 5%, so 0 0.05. So I know my answer should be in and around 0 0.05 meters per second squared. Approximately, approximately, approximately. Okay, I'm forgetting my approximate signs. Um, and this is, this is a good technique. I cannot mention this enough. This is why I keep doing it. Um, it's a sanity check for you. When you're on a test and you're plugging in your numbers in your calculator, um, you will, you will absolutely have calculator mistakes. Everyone does. And I do not want you to lose marks because of your calculator mistakes. So this way you can sort of check without a calculator, I should have an answer in and around 0 0.05. If it's too far different than that, I'm going to redo my calculation with my calculator. So um, let's just check the answer. The, the, the actual answer is in fact 0 0.059. So the actual answer is pretty much 0. Point, oh, that is weirdly blurry, 0 0.06. So that's pretty close. Without a calculator, I got 0 0.05. So that tells me if I were to use a calculator and you know I were to do all my numbers and I got 0 0.059, I, I would be trusting my calculator that I didn't make a mistake there. OK, um, moving on. So that's fine and dandy. Um, actually, you know what, before we move on, I'm going to actually check in with you guys because we've actually covered a decent amount of material. So I'm going to check in with you guys and I'm going to open the chat here and I'm going to see if you guys have any questions. Um, if you want to just type something in the chat, uh, I'll see it and I can, and I can answer it for you. Uh, the, the most recent question was about sig figs. I would say sig figs in general don't matter on tests. Um, some physics profs, maybe downtown to Scarborough or maybe from high school, um, they really drill you hard on, on significant figures. Um, when it comes to test questions that are just kind of like standard textbook questions like we've been doing in lecture, you have enough to worry about. Um, you know, I, I would much prefer that you have numerical literacy, meaning you can like you can pretty accurately approximate the answer like I do in, in, you know, in my notes here. I say, oh, it should be around 0 0.05. You know, that to me is worth way more than following some sort of arbitrary you know, significant figures rules. You know, oh, there's two significant figures in the question, so I must have two in the answer. No, that's, that's not worth it. Um, but I will say, though, um, if you're doing uncertainty propagation, let's say you do like um, any sort of experimental measurements in a lab, and you know, your measurement has an associated uncertainty with it, like a plus minus value, uh, then yes, absolutely, that is inherently a different situation than just kind of testing students to see if they can apply physics knowledge. Um, you know, if, if, if in the lab you do like drug trials or you know, you're taking culture samples, like your, your uncertainty in your measurement is absolutely important. But you know, test questions, it'll, it'll be clear from reading the question um, if, if uncertainty is important or not. It'll be very, very abundantly clear. Um, is it okay if I ask a question about assignment one? No, not at this time. This is about the lecture. Um, if we do the following sig figs, uh, you include two sig figs, but the answer is three. Do we get the wrong, would we get that wrong in the exam or test? No, I mean, if, like I just finished saying, if you want to put, you know, three sig figs instead of two, on a test, that's fine, assuming the question isn't specifically testing your ability to propagate uncertainty. But if you are propagating uncertainty, like you are on the, on the labs, um, it'll be clear. There'll be plus minus values in the question for you. Are there any other questions before we move on? Uh, and the F net equation is the sum of all individual forces uh, you mentioned the net force itself is not a force. However, for F net equals MA, F net is a force, correct? No, F net is not a force. F net is, is the sum of all forces. Um, it's, F net itself is not a force. Um, the units of the value are, of course, newtons. But, you know, gravity is a force. Um, the, you know, me pushing a ball or me pushing a cart, that mean my, my push from my hand is a, is a particular force. 
F net is the sum of all forces. You know, it's the sum of gravity and friction and normal force and, you know, all this other stuff. Um, it's not just one force, it's many forces acting all together. So it's not, it's not a particular force, it is a resultant force. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any other pressing questions. So I think we're good to actually move on. A uh, student just emailed me in the class, so they're either not listening or they're not in the class at the moment. Okay, um, still needs more practice. So we've done one question that sort of introduced the idea of friction. Um, it was relatively simple because there was only one object involved. Now, um, I am going to start to develop for you a sort of a, a plan of attack. How do you approach any dynamics uh, question that you get, either in any textbook, any course, any exam question, any midterm question? There's a very structured way to approach these sort of dynamic questions. So that's what I'm going to model for you here. The previous question with the car was relatively easy. We could, we could sort of get away without um, you know, having too much structure. But this one, if you don't stay organized, this one's going to blow your brain. So let me show you how to stay organized. The figure below shows three blocks being pushed across a frictionless floor. Because why not? You know, why, why wouldn't it be frictionless? Um, we push it with force F. What total mass is accelerated to the right by uh, A, uh, the, what, what total, sorry, what total mass is accelerated to the right by the force? That's part A. Um, part B, what total mass is being accelerated by the force F21? And three, what force is being uh, uh, accelerated by the force 32? Blah, 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 blah. And D, rank, rank the forces, and then E, find their accelerations and all that stuff. Um, here's really what I'm getting there. This, this situation represents a compound object. So I'm going to write that down. Compound object. Now, let's think about this logically. If three blocks are, are um, sitting side by side, pushed up against each other, and I push one end, you can easily see in real life all three blocks will be moving together as I push one side, right? This is analogous to say um, materials being made up of smaller parts that are sort of adhered together. Your car, for instance, your car has a lot of screws and bolts in it and you know, you, you've got doors that are screwed into the frame of the car, you've got seats that are screwed into the frame of the car. If you push the car with force F, everything touching that car is being moved forward by that force F, right? However, I myself, if I'm pushing a car, I'm touching maybe the trunk of the car. You know, I've got my hands on the trunk of the car and I'm pushing. I'm not physically touching the seat inside the car. I'm not physically touching the engine that is bolted inside of the, the hood of the car. Yet, all of these things are moving forward. So there has to be some amount of force that is touching this chair or touching the door or touching the engine that is responsible for pushing it forward. And that would be the contact point between these objects. So this contact point here between block one and block two and the contact here between block two and block three, that could represent, you know, some glue that glues two objects together. That could represent a bolt that bolts two objects together. If you want to think of biology in, in your body, you know, that could be the joint, you know, the joint in your shoulder. When you walk forward with your legs, all parts of your body move forward. It's not like your arms stay behind you, you know. Um, when, when, when your torso moves forward, there's a sort of force within the joint here that pulls your arms forward with it, which would, you know, either be in your ligaments or your tendons. So um, there, are, there are internal forces that are responsible for, for objects moving together as one cohesive unit. So let's sort of stay, stay organized here. I've sort of expanded your brain a little bit to thinking of solid objects as, as a sum of little tiny objects held together either by intermolecular forces or ligaments or bolts, you know, depending if we're talking about, you know, molecules, people, or cars. But let's, let's 
show you kind of how physicists would break this down and analyze this in, a, in an organized way. So first of all, we would start with something called a free body diagram. So step number one, when you study forces questions is always start with a free body diagram, always. The first, I'm gonna repeat this because it's very important. The first step you do when you do forces questions is always free body diagrams. If you send me an email saying, hey Mark, I'm confused on this question, um, can you help me? I'm gonna respond to you Let's see your free body diagram. That should always be step number one. I can understand if you're stuck with other parts, but unless you have a free body diagram on the page, I will not help you because I am, that's a freebie. I'm telling everyone now, that is an easy step number one that you always, always do, is you always start with a free body diagram. So let's do that now. I'll show you what that looks like. So there's actually gonna be four free body diagrams, even though there's three objects. So the first free body diagram is gonna be when you have the total mass all together. And if you think, because this, this, this object of three individual masses, they do move all together, all at once. So you can actually think of them as, as one object, one mass, mass total. And there is a horizontal force F being applied to it. So a free body diagram labels all the forces that are physically touching the object. So if we think of these three blocks as, as one object, these three blocks as one solid object, I label all the forces. Now I know that there's gravity acting on it as well. There's also a normal force. We haven't quite got there yet. So just for now I'm gonna label F because F is the only force that is really talked about in the question. Now, the question also breaks down for you uh, the, the different types of forces that are in between the two objects. We would call those intermolecular forces if we're in chemistry class. Um, you know, if you're a biologist, you might talk about the, the for, you know, those are the forces in your tendons and your ligaments. These are the internal forces. So I can take this scenario and I can actually break it down into analyzing mass one, mass, oh, I don't need that much space. Let's erase that. Mass one, mass two, and mass three. So I can look at every, every chunk of this, this bigger object individually if I wanted to, and I could look at the forces acting on, this, on these individual particles. So uh, for particle one, the five kilogram, the five kilogram mass, we know there's a force F that is physically acting on it, right? We can see that right here. There is someone pushing with force F on it. However, is there another force acting on this object? And uh, I haven't explicitly taught you Newton's third law yet, and I'm about to, but let me, let me reason with you how this is gonna work. If, if there was no other force acting on block one, then my free body diagram would only show one force. And the acceleration would be F over five equals the acceleration. However, that assumes there's no other objects around it. I'm just, I'm literally pushing block five kilograms with force F and it'll have a certain acceleration with it. In real life, the situation is all of these objects are being pushed with force F. So in real life, the acceleration is F over, what is this, 17? 17 kilograms. So the real acceleration is actually a lot smaller than this. So this tells me there has to be another force acting on this object. And if that still doesn't do it for you, picture this. Picture you are block five, five kilograms, and your friend, maybe you have a short friend, I don't know, uh, that you're standing right next to your friend, block two kilograms, all right? Let's say I come up and I push you into your friend. You'll, you, you obviously feel me pushing you, obviously feel me pushing you, right? But as soon as I push you into your friend, 
you know, your face is going to get smushed and, you know, you're going to get pushed backwards. Um, you're going to feel an impact of me pushing you into your friend. So that actually tells you that your friend or the other block in this case is actually inherently pushing back on you. And we're going to call this the force uh, from block, uh, from block two on block one, F sub two one the force from your friend on you. So now when I want to study the acceleration, my net force is going to be F minus F21 divided by M1 equals my acceleration. And this acceleration should in fact equal the acceleration of all three blocks. All three blocks move together. So when I calculate my acceleration, um, it should be, should be the same in all three analyses. So what I've just described here, F21, that's in fact Newton's third law. Newton's third law says, if I push an object, it will push back on me with the same force that I'm pushing on it. Now, please be, don't, don't be confused here. I am pushing on block one with force F. That does not mean block one is pushing on block two with force F. Block one is pushing on block two with force F12 force from one on object two. Again, this is why you start with a free body diagram. You have to draw the forces that are physically touching the object. Let's draw the free body diagram for the middle block and hopefully this becomes a little bit more clear. The middle block here is my force F physically touching the middle block? No. What, what is physically touching the middle block? Well, what's physically touching the middle block is there is a rightward force, F12, the force from block one on block two. That is what's physically touching block two. Now, block two is also in contact with block three. So we have a resistive force or, or a Newton's third law. We have a, a backwards force of force three, two, the force of block three on block two. And I do know that F one, two is going to equal F two, one, or should I say the magnitude of these are going to equal. They're, the directions are obviously opposite. Um, one is directed to the left, one is directed right, but the magnitudes are the same. And this is because of Newton's third law. For every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. If, if the first block pushes on the second block with a certain force, then the second block is going to push back on the first block with exactly the same force. So when I do my analysis here, I'm going to say F12 minus F32 over M2 is going to equal the acceleration. And that's going to be the same acceleration I would calculate over there with the first one. And then lastly, my third free body diagram. Uh, again, I'm looking at the forces physically touching object three, physically touching it. The only thing touching block three is block two. Therefore, I only have one force and it's force from block two on block three. And again, I know from Newton's third law that the magnitude of force three, two is gonna to equal to the magnitude of force two, three. Equal and opposite, meaning equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. And this uh, Newton's second law in this case is also fairly easy. Um, F net in this case, is simply one force, F23, 
and that would equal M3A. So the acceleration of block three would be F23 over M3. And again, it would be the same acceleration we would calculate over there. So let's go back to the question to see what they're asking. And then hopefully the analysis that we did over here on the right hand side uh, will allow us to answer these questions. So uh, part A, what is the total mass that is accelerated by force capital F? Force capital F, uh, let me change my color there. Force capital F is accelerating all three blocks. So it, it, what is force F accelerating? 17 kilograms, that's the answer to part A. What total mass is accelerated by force 2, 1? Well, force 2, 1 is pushing the other two blocks. Not the first block, but um, the other two blocks are being pushed by force 2, 1. And uh, what is the force, uh, what is the mass that the force F32 is pushing? Just the last block, just the last one. Uh, and then what does it say? Rank the blocks according to their accelerations. Logically, we can think and reason that the accelerations should all be the same. You know, if I take three objects, um, I, I don't even have three objects around me really to do this, but if I take three objects and I push them, then they all move together. It's like a train, really. If you think of like the engine on a train, or I'm sure you've all been on the subway or a go train, you have the force at the, at the, at the uh, engine of the train, and when the engine moves forward, all the cars and all the trains move together. They're, they all have the same acceleration. And then E, rank the forces F, F21 and F32 uh, in terms of their magnitude, greatest first. Well, um, F, just F without a subscript, F will obviously be the largest force. And then F21 will be slightly weaker. And then F23, or F, sorry, F32 will be the weakest out of the three of them. And the way, the way in which you can figure this out is because um, they all result in the same acceleration, right? A is all the same in all three cases, but um, capital F is responsible for accelerating a larger mass and uh, F21 is responsible for accelerating a smaller mass, but the ratio is the same number. So, you know, if, if you have a constant that equals F over M, then if, if M goes down, oh, hey, it's disappearing. Constant equals F over M. If M goes down, force goes down. So as, as, the, as the amount of mass that the force is responsible for decreases, the force decreases. So rank the forces. I know that F is largest because M is largest. And I know F21 is in the middle because it's accelerating the middle amount of mass. And then F32 is the smallest because it's accelerating the least amount of mass. So um, that is the opening of, of how to uh, approach problems. Um, this was to sort of present what a free body diagram was. And the, the important thing to remember here is a free body diagram should always be the very first thing you do. Okay. Um, I don't actually think, yeah. Okay. So types of forces. Uh, we've talked a lot about kind of how to, you know, what is a force, Newton's laws, um, inertia, F net equals MA, and um, equal and opposite reaction forces. And I introduced to you the idea of a free body diagram. And that is sort of the start of how to analyze dynamic questions. Although I'm still in the middle of developing that for you with the subsequent examples. But before we go on to other examples, I need to sort of add a piece of the puzzle that is currently missing. Uh, in order to study forces, we need to know what types of forces exist out there. So I can only really finish teaching you how to approach these questions um, you know, when, when we talk about what kind of forces we can have in various problems. So let's look now, uh, types of forces. There's gravity. Um, gravity is equal to, the force of gravity that is, is equal to the object's mass times the local acceleration due to gravity, little g. 
mg. The normal force is the force that is missing from that video I showed you. Remember how he was saying that there was a downward force and everyone agreed that there was a downward force of gravity and he was saying, well, is there any other force? And everyone's like, oh, there's atmospheric forces, there's forces in my body. Um, yeah, they're technically not wrong, but what the host was trying to go for was normal force. There's a normal force from the surface of the earth pushing upwards on, on your body. Um, Anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about normal force as the course progresses, but please understand that normal force, uh, is this red? Yeah, normal force, actually, let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, so gravity um, is always present. Um, there is nowhere that gravity doesn't exist. Um, gravity might be weak, but gravity is always present. Um, you know, even in space, if you're far away from Earth, gravity might be weak, but it's still there. Um, normal force. Normal force is only present when in contact with a surface. And really, it's a result of Newton's third law. Gravity pulls you into the Earth's surface. Now, if you were the Earth's surface, you can't tell if gravity is the one pulling the object into you or if the object is being pushed by something else into it. All the surface feels is an object on top of it um, being pushed into the surface of the Earth. So Newton's third law says, um, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. If there's an object on the Earth's surface pushing down with mg, then there's going to be a normal force pushing up equal and opposite mg. That's Newton's third law. Um, it doesn't have to be mg. For instance, um, you know, you can talk about, you know, like my phone being on top of my table. Um, in fact, I'm just going to look at my video here. I don't actually know if you can see yeah, you can see my phone in the video. So, um, yeah, you have an object sitting on a table. Right now, gravity's pulling the object into the table, and the table says, oh, I feel something pushing on me, so I'm going to push up with the same amount of force that is, this, this object is exerting. In this case, it's mg. I could apply extra force. I could actually take my hand, and I could push the phone into the table extra hard. The table doesn't know what's happening. Maybe I've added more mass to my phone. Maybe I've put a textbook on my phone, or maybe I'm just pushing, like, you know, maybe I just want to abuse the table. Maybe I'm just, you know, taking my arm and pushing the phone into the table. The table doesn't know the difference. All the table feels is the force being exerted on the table is larger than it was before. So the table's going to push back with the same amount of force. That's Newton's third law. Um, but please don't be, uh, don't get fooled. The normal force is only present uh, as a surface contact force. The object has to be physically touching a surface in order for there to be a normal force. Um, if I take an object, I'm not going to drop my phone. And like I said, I don't have anything around me at the moment. But if I take a ball and I were to drop the ball, gravity is acting on the ball, so the ball would fall. But the ball is not in contact with any surface. So as the ball is falling, there would be no normal force because there's no surface that it's touching. So please, please, please be aware. Normal force is only for when there's a surface. We will be doing some examples later on to sort of clarify that. Um, friction. Friction is another type of, of force. Now, um, it took a long time for, stu uh, uh, for physicists to figure this out, but friction is actually equal to uh, a coefficient of friction mu multiplied by the normal force. Um, normal force is not necessarily mg, so please don't get that mixed up. The friction is not mu mg, it's mu fn, the normal force. Whatever the normal force that that object is experiencing, multiply it by the coefficient of friction mu, and then you have your friction. Now, uh, what is mu? Again, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in depth later on, but just so you have a sort of heads up. You can imagine that um, two, two objects touching each other inherently have a, a slipperiness to them. 
let's say in the winter time, now we live in Canada, Southern Ontario, most of us, maybe you're abroad at the moment, but you know, in the winter time here, it's icy and snowy out. So when you're walking on the sidewalk, if your rubber shoe or rubber boot touches an icy surface, that's very slippery, meaning there's not a lot of friction. It's not that the normal force is lower, right? You're still the same mass. If anything, you're a little bit heavier in the winter because you've got this big heavy winter coat on and these big heavy winter boots. So it's not that the normal force has decreased. What's happened is the coefficient of friction between those two surfaces is small, meaning the coefficient of friction between, let's say, rubber boots and ice is really small. But if you had two different surfaces, let's say rubber boots and pavement or concrete, like in the summertime when there's no ice, when you're walking around in the summertime, you don't have to worry about slipping and falling, uh, hopefully. I mean, maybe if you're clumsy, that's a whole other can of worms. But in terms of physics, in the summertime, um, the coefficient of friction between rubber and regular old dry concrete is fairly high, meaning there's a lot of friction between rubber and concrete, meaning they do not want to slide on one another, right? If you've got a high coefficient of friction, they don't want to slide. A low coefficient of friction, they want to slide. Um, so driving a car is actually a lot about friction as well. You know, when you're driving a car and it's icy out, um, there's a low coefficient of friction and you have a lot of a lot of mass in a car, so you need a lot of friction to, to slow it down, right? Acceleration, F net equals MA. Um, if you've got a small amount of friction, you can only achieve a small amount of deceleration. So you got to be careful when you're driving in the wintertime. Um, tension. Tension is another type of force. Um, tension is kind of funny. Tension only happens when you have a rope. In the same way that uh, normal force only happens when you have a, a surface that you're touching, uh, ropes only provide a tension when there's a rope. Uh, a surface cannot provide a tension, right? Um, the other fun thing about a rope is you can't push a rope. Every single year on, on tests, when I mark tests, there's always at least one student that thinks you can actually apply a, a pushing force on a rope and it would uh, somehow push the object. You can't push a rope, you can only pull. Um, there's actually a very famous saying in physics, you can't push a rope. In fact, there's actually wanting to title one of my, um, you know, like, like the course or something, you know, there's a picture of, you know, a crane or something as the course picture. I was actually trying to figure out if I could make a sort of logo that says you can't push a rope. It's a very famous saying in physics. Um, anyway, and another type of force we're gonna, we're gonna see is just sort of a generic miscellaneous. It's called the applied force. That could be, you know, the applied force from an engine, could be applied force from me pushing something. It's just sort of like, everything else that doesn't really fall into a, a different category. So those are the different types of forces. And now that we sort of have um, other types of forces to work with, we can actually do some more interesting problems. And now I can model for you from start to finish how to actually solve um, some uh, actual problems. Okay, um, moving forward. Talking about friction, because friction is a little bit interesting. Let's, let's look at a conceptual example to figure out if we can see where friction is going. Picture a pickup truck or a flatbed truck, if you will. A truck is initially stationary and then accelerates to the right. So it accelerates to the right. If you are having trouble picturing this, you can picture yourself sitting on a, on a school bus, right? So, uh, or a, a city bus. I guess we don't take school buses anymore. So picture the box as you and the truck as like a, a city bus. So the truck is initially at rest, the bus is initially at rest, and then the bus or the truck accelerates to the right. And you, or the box, is sitting uh, not even strapped in, like there's no seat belt or anything, it's just kind of loosely sitting on the flatbed uh, when, the, when, the uh, when the truck accelerates to the right. Since the box was also initially at rest and is not moving, the box too would have undergone an acceleration. Presumably when you put cargo on a truck and the truck moves forwards, presumably you want the cargo to go with the truck. So if the truck were to move forward, presumably the cargo would move with it. That's all that that sentence is saying. Um, thus implying that if the box was uh, at first at rest and then moving, the box would have undergone an acceleration. So what, what this whole question is saying, 
what this whole question is saying, um, oh, I guess the, that didn't move with it. There we go. So what this whole question is saying is the, oh, sorry, the speed of the box initially was equal to zero and the speed of the box um, final was not equal to zero. Meaning if you look at the average acceleration, oh, that's a terrible average. If you look at the average acceleration, it would be V2 minus V1 over delta T. Um, V2 does not equal V1. So this would just be V2 minus zero over delta T, which is not equal to zero. So this is just saying that the acceleration is non-zero. And if you look at Newton's second law, F net equals MA, this, all this is saying is if the acceleration is not zero, then the net force felt by the box is not zero, which means there must be a force acting on the box to get it accelerating or to get it moving. What is that force? The only thing touching that box, and again, this is why I'm stressing, you need to write a free body diagram. Uh, what color? I'm red. Let's change to black. If I draw a free body diagram, draw the forces that are physically touching the box, nothing else. You cannot label force engine. The engine is not connected to the box. So label the forces that are, uh, that are touching the box. We've got gravity downwards. We have the normal force, right? The, um, the flat bed of, of the truck is pushing up on the box. And what else is there? Well, we do know the box is going to accelerate forward. So we know it in, in some capacity, there's going to be some sort of uh, applied force forwards. Now, can we figure out what that force is going to be? Well, it's not tension because there's no rope. It's not a normal force because the normal force is pointing upwards, not horizontally. Um, it's not, what other, what other options do we have? Uh, it's not gravity, right? Because gravity is, uh, is downwards and obviously not horizontal. So the only other force that it could possibly be is friction. So friction is the thing responsible for carrying uh, this box forward on a flatbed. And if you're sitting on a city bus, presumably there's friction between your butt and the bus seat. So when the bus goes to move forwards, you also move forwards. And what is the force responsible for, for getting you to move forwards? It's the friction between your butt and the seat. Now, what happens if the acceleration of the truck is too large? Well, if the friction, if the acceleration of the truck is too large, then uh, it might overcome friction and the box might just slide right off of the bus or right off of the truck. Now on a bus, luckily for safety, um, bus seats tend to have a back on them. So when you're sitting, if friction isn't enough to pull you forward, when the bus is accelerating, uh, you'll find yourself the seat, let me turn sideways so I can model this for you. Uh, you might be sitting forward a little bit when, you're, when you take the bus. And uh, when the bus moves forward, friction is actually gonna try to pull you forward. But if the bus is, is accelerating too much, you might find yourself like being pushed back in the seat. And then it's the normal force. Normal force, remember, is a surface contact force. My back is touching the surface of the seat. So if I get pushed back into the seat, then the seat is actually pushing me forward. Okay, so the, the force from the bus's engine is not actually touching my body. What's touching my body is the friction between my butt and the seat. And if the bus is accelerating too much for friction uh, to, to handle, then um, my back might be thrown backwards because I would actually be in the middle of sliding off of the bus. So I would slide right into the back seat here and then the normal force would kick in and the normal force uh, would be pushing me forward. 
So um, the weird thing here is where's the friction? The friction is actually forwards. Um, I know in high school they teach you friction opposes motion. That's sort of true. Um, in this case, the motion is forwards, right? The box is moving to the right. And my free body diagram says the friction also has to be to the right. So um, please, please don't be fooled. You really have to think about very carefully where friction is pointing in this case. Um, I will give you a hint. If you want to rectify the statement friction always opposes motion, I will give you a hint. Um, this is a frame of reference uh, illusion. Oop, that's a very messy way to spell illusion. It's a frame of reference illusion. So um, when, if we're standing on the ground, it looks like the box is moving forward and friction is moving forward. But if you were the one on the bus, uh, or if you were the one on the back of this pickup truck, as the pickup truck moves forwards, um, as far as you're concerned, the one standing on the pickup truck, uh, you're moving backwards or you're gonna want to move backwards, right? Inertia, you're at rest, you're gonna to wanna to remain at rest. So as the, as the truck moves forwards, uh, your body wants to stay where it is. So uh, as far as your body is concerned, it wants to move backwards. So the motion according to your body would be backwards. So friction is actually forwards, which pulls you forwards. So it's a frame of reference issue. Okay, here is uh, an actual full-blown question. Um, we're gonna need free body diagrams, we're gonna need F net equals MA, and we're gonna need to actually derive an equation. So here's the full-blown, this is like the first full-blown example we're gonna do where we actually have to put all of these things we've learned into practice, okay? So let's carefully read this. Consider two blocks that are resting on top of one another. The lower block, has mass capital M2 and is resting on a nearly frictionless surface, which doesn't exist in real life, but let's pretend. The upper block is smaller and has mass M1. Let's assume there's a coefficient of friction between the two blocks of mu. Calculate the maximum force that the lower block can be pulled with so that the two blocks move together without slipping. So that's analogous to something like this. If you had a bottom object, like a bottom block here, this is just an upside down Kleenex box for the record, and you had, this is a very expensive phone, so let's hope I don't break it. And if you had a second object, placed on top. Now you can't really see that in the camera. Is there something here? Here's an even more expensive object. <laughs> it's an iPad. So if we had a second object placed on top of this of this Kleenex box, clearly if I um, if I pull slowly horizontally, the iPad and the Kleenex box will move together. So there's a, a minimum Excel or there, there's a a small amount of acceleration that will work to move both of these together. But these two are not glued together. There's no bolts between them. There's no, um, there's no seat belt keeping them in. Um, they're just loosely placed on top of each other. So when I pull the bottom block forward and the top block follows, it's friction that pulls the, the iPad forward in the same way that it was friction that pulled the box on that pickup truck forward. Here's the premise of the question though. If I pull too hard and the acceleration of the bottom block is too fast, the top block will slide right off of it. So here's an example of that. And let's hope I don't break my iPad doing this. It fell right off. If the acceleration of the bottom block is too large, the top one will slide right off. Just like that. And that's when it overcomes the force of friction. So that's what we're asked to study. So hopefully the context makes a little bit more sense now. Now, uh, we might take a little bit more than six minutes to do this, but um, it shouldn't be too long. So bear with me. So um, let's just have at it. Step one, I told you. Oh, I'm still working with black. Step one, always draw free body diagrams. 
So uh, there's going to be three free body diagrams, one, in, one for each individual object, and then a third one for all the objects moving together. Um, our goal here is without slipping, which means you can think of these objects as moving all together, kind of like when I move forward with my body, my arms and my legs and all my organs inside, they all move with me, even though there's separate objects inside of me, like organs, um, they're all moving as one unit. So there's going to be three different free body diagrams. So let's draw the first one um, as one unit. So I'm going I'm to label this mass total. Um, there's going to be a force pulling it, F, and there's going to be a total force of gravity downwards, Fg total, and there's going to be a normal force upwards. And the question says there's no friction. So I think there's only three forces acting on this thing. And I can also draw a free body diagram for each of the objects individually. So let's go ahead and draw those as well. Um, let's say for the top object, which I think is labeled object one. So we know gravity, gravity is easy, it's always a freebie, gravity of object one. Now object one is sitting, although object one isn't sitting on a table, it's sitting on object two. And object two is, is still a surface. So object two is actually pushing back with some sort of normal force. And like I said before, normal force is a result of Newton's third law. It's the pushback. And um, what force is physically, 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 physically touching object one, the top object? It's not F. F is a, a, a touching object two, the bottom one. As we saw before with the pickup truck example, the thing pulling the object forward is the force of friction to the right. And we have one other one, it's the bottom one. And the bottom box, or the bottom object, we have a forward force of F. We have its own gravity pulling down on it. But we also have a downward force of gravity from the top one, right? You know, picture your little, your little sibling sitting on you. I don't know if you, you know, when you were younger, you used to do that. I don't know. But, um, you know, if you're laying on the ground and your little brother comes to sit on you, you as the bottom person definitely feel the weight of the top person. And um, there's going to be a normal force upward on the bottom box, for sure, from the surface. Um, but there's also another force we're missing. And it's the backwards force of friction. And again, this is a result of Newton's third law. There's rubbing between the two, the two objects. So the top object will feel the friction and the bottom object will feel the friction. It's just like when you rub your hand on your arm, both your hand feels the friction and your arm feels the friction, right? Both objects will feel the friction in opposite, in opposite directions. So that's step one. Step one is always free body diagram. Step two is physically perform F net equals MA. So what are we asked for? We're asked for the maximum acceleration. That's what we want. We want the maximum acceleration without breaking static friction. So let's start with the top one. Seems like a good place to start. So we have F net in the X direction equals MA in the X direction. And then we have F net in the Y direction equals MA in the Y direction. So we've got two dimensions, left, right, and up, down, or X negative X and positive Y negative Y. So um, let's start with the X directional forces. Looking at, well, why won't this scroll? There we go. Um, looking at this object, the X directional forces is only the force of friction equals M1A. And the force of friction we know is mu Fn for block one equals M1A. 
Uh, do we have mu? Yes, we do. It's labeled in the question as mu. I don't know what the value is, but we're given the value. Fn, we do not yet know what the value of the normal force is. M, do we have mass of block one? Yes, we do. It's given in the question. And acceleration, we need. So let's move on to the y direction. Looking at my y variables, I have a normal force from object one upwards. And in opposite to that, I have the force of gravity for object one downwards. Um, are there any other forces in the y direction? I'm looking, uh, I'm looking over here at my free body diagram, and I don't think so. I only have two forces in the y direction, Fn up and then Fg1 down. And then in the x direction, there's only one force, force of friction. So um, this means I'm, this is going to equal m. And what's the acceleration in the y direction? It's ma, yeah, f net equals ma. But the acceleration of the y direction is the acceleration vertically, up or down. Is this object accelerating up or down? And the answer is no. So zero, which means the normal force, in fact, equals gravity in this case, or, or in this case, Fn equals mg. And I can actually use this and plug it in over here. So this is going to be mu m1g equals m1a. And the m's will cancel. So interestingly, it actually doesn't even matter what the mass of the box is. Um, we actually see here, I need to insert some space. So we actually see here that mu g equals the acceleration. If the acceleration of the box goes beyond mu g, it will slip. Okay, uh, what else do they want? What is the maximum force? Okay, so we have the maximum acceleration. Now we want to know the maximum force. Uh, if you want to, we could in fact go to the second uh, the second free body diagram and, you know, plug everything into there. We have all the information. We have uh, Fg2, we have Fg1, we now have the force of friction, right? The force of friction is mu m1g, um, and we could solve for the applied force. We, we know all of that, and it would 100% work. So if you wanted to do that and get your, and solve for your force F, that would work beautifully. However, um, we can actually use this one as well because they're moving together. And if they're moving together, uh, we can actually treat all, now that we know the acceleration, the acceleration of, of the unit as a whole is mu g, which means the acceleration of, the acceleration of my Kleenex box and iPad together, moving forward, the acceleration of that is allowed to be no larger than mu g. So as long as the acceleration is less than mu g, I can treat these as one object. So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and treat them as one object and use this free body diagram. So we perform F net equals MA a second time, but using a different free body diagram than what we did before, because analyzing the same thing a second time doesn't do us any good. So here, looking at this free body diagram, again, I have two directions. I have F net X equals MA X, and I have F net Y equals MAY. So let's go through and do this again. F net X, what kind of forces do I have in the X direction? This is why it's important to have a free body diagram. Let's look. The only force in the X direction is F. So let's go ahead and write F equals MA. And do we know A? Well, yes, we do in fact know A. A is mu g. So this is going to be mass total times mu g equals f. So the question asks, what is the maximum force with which we are able to pull on the lower object? The maximum force that we are able to pull on the lower object is m total times mu times g or m1 plus m2 times mu g. And there you go. That's your final answer for this, for this question. 
Okay, so that's where we're gonna stop. Um, the final solution is also here in case you didn't quite follow. So this is a, on a lecture slide that might be easier for you to follow. And um, we're gonna pick up tomorrow where we left off. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about friction and we're gonna talk about ropes and pulleys tomorrow and circular motion maybe on Wednesday. So um, hopefully this was a good introduction. Um, just to summarize, we talked about uh, an introduction to forces, what a force is. We talked about Newton's uh, laws, uh, the first law of inertia, the second law, F naught equals MA, and the third law, which is for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force, which is really the birth of the normal force. So that's where the normal force comes from. So we introduced all of those, and we did a few examples of how to use free body diagrams and uh, how to use free body diagrams in conjunction with Newton's second law to actually approach and solve some physics problems. So that's what we did today. Um, you have a lot of practice to do um, in addition to some assignments to work on. Um, this is a summer course, so it is fairly fast paced, but unfortunately we can't, we can't just make the course easier because it's in the summer, right? It's the same, it's the same credit that we get as, as any other time. So, um, you know, we're just gonna have to buckle down and just do, do a lot of work. Um, that's just what it is. I wish we had, you know, a normal amount of time to do this course, but um, we don't. So anyway, there's a summary for today. I would strongly encourage you to go back, um, read the typed lecture notes, do some sample problems in the textbook. I'm not saying you have to do like the whole, you know, the, all, all the questions in the back of the book, but you know, you should be doing some of them immediately after the lecture to just go and practice some of these uh, concepts. And then maybe when you have more time after the assignments are due, you can go back and do a few more in, in practice. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. So if, if you're watching later, um, I will see you tomorrow. And after I stop the recording, I will take some, some specific questions from the chat. Okay, um, nice seeing everyone. And uh, for the people watching later, I'll see you tomorrow.